Boardroom Bound, Episode 24. What is the best way to land a board seat? With Peter Gleason. You know, usually you took a traditional route. Maybe you were a nonprofit director in your local community, then you went to a private company board, maybe you went to a small public company board, and then you worked your way through the system to get up into the bigger companies. Um, what we're seeing now, partly because of this push for new new thinking in the boardroom is we've seen a lot of first-time directors go on very large company boards. Hello and welcome to this episode of Boardroom Bound. My name is Alexander Lowry and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership in the boardroom. My goal is to give new and aspiring directors the tips, tactics, and strategies necessary to transform your confidence and build a successful career as a board director. Quick reminder that you can get all of today's show notes at podcast.gordon.edu. In today's show, we'll be speaking with Peter Gleason. And Peter is the president and CEO of the National Association of Corporate Directors. This is an organization which provides education, best practices, industry research, and networking for more than 21,000 directors on public and private boards. Peter is a recognized expert on board leadership and corporate governance issues. He serves as a member of NACD's national faculty, is regularly quoted in the national media, and is a frequent presenter on the subject of corporate governance, executive and director compensation, risk, strategic planning, and board and share owner relations. In short, an expert on everything who is our audience is targeting, new and aspiring directors, this is what you're going to want to learn. So in today's show, Peter will be walking us through the NACD perspective, and not only just why it exists, how it exists, how it's growing, developing, how it's changing, how it's improving its curriculum and its training, the wonderful networking opportunities they provide, which is an essential way, as we've talked about in the show before, about how getting on a board works. Somewhere between two-thirds and three-quarters of board seats are filled through this sort of network. NACD provides that opportunity from their annual mega summit event in D.C. with about 2,000 participants to the local chapters. And they have about 21 chapters across the country where people come and hear programming, get education, and also get a chance to network. All of these are essential parts of why we do it, but Peter also frames this as a larger perspective of what's going on in the board world. Why is this so important today? Not only as a feather in your cap to help you stand out and be seen as a candidate, but you're so you're prepared to be successful in the boardroom. We sort of cover the entire range of everything we want to cover on this show today, and we talk all about NACD and how it can be a great resource for you as you grow and develop in your board career. So let's jump into the show. Peter Gleason, welcome to the Boardroom Bound Podcast. Thanks, Alexander. It's great to be with you. Delighted to be talking through all things NACD today, the National Association of Corporate Directors. You guys do so much great work for so many people. I think, what is it, something like 20,000 people, the directors and public and private boards that you help prepare and get ready for all their future opportunities and problems? Uh, about 21,000, actually. Okay. <laughs> we, we continue to grow as we speak. So. <laughs> well, we will be able to talk about all of that today in terms of the history and the growth and development and the future of not only the board, but your organization. And maybe we should just start with a grounding. Could we begin by talking about NACD's mission? And I know you've been there what, about 18 and a half years, so you probably embody it and understand it better than anybody else. <laughs> yeah, well, I have been there 18 years. Your, your stats are exactly right, Alexander. But our mission is to elevate board performance, and we do that by providing practical information and insights uh, through our through our education programs, through our research, and through our network of directors, those those twenty one thousand people that you just talked about create a very formidable network of directors that can share ideas and share leading practices. And so. on, on this audience, uh, in this show, we talk a lot about for our audience that the networking is the fundamental way most board roles will get filled. You hear a variation in the stats, maybe two thirds or three quarters, but at the end of the day, you probably want to bring someone in who you know and who's vetted and comes into your organization. I imagine for most people, that's probably one of the fundamental reasons why they're thinking NACD should be a big part of, of their corporate board portfolio life because they're surrounding themselves with like-minded people, not only to learn, but literally to do that networking. Is that is that a typical way people think about it? Um, yeah, exactly. The, it's, it's funny you say that because that's almost the advice that I give every single person <laughs> who calls me and says, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, transitioning from my C-suite role to a board role, you know, how should, what are my first steps? And I said, I constantly tell them to network. Mm. I mean, that is where you make the connections. 
And it's usually not the first connection. It's not the first person connection of, you know, I know Alexander and he knows me and that's yeah. how I'm going to get this board seat. It's the secondary one where you're talking to somebody and you say, you know, I, I met this guy, Pete Gleason, the other day uh, who's, you know, CEO of this company. He's thinking about getting on a board. He might be the right fit for the board you're talking about. So it's, it's the second connection, not necessarily the first one. But you can only get those second connections active if you're out there networking and, and doing a good job with it. I think that's exactly right. In, in my mind, it's not who you know that matters. It's who you know that knows what you want because then they can be right. helpful for you. And I think that's why LinkedIn is so powerful. They, they've learned from the mathematical science, third degree connection is the furthest you can possibly get up and be powerful. But just like you've talked about, second degree is so powerful because there's someone between you who's vouching for you. Um, so I, I think that really fits well. But help us understand setting the scene. So some of our audience are new board members. Maybe they've just gotten their first role and they're thinking, wow, I need to figure out how I do this really well and really quickly. And a lot more of them are aspiring. And it could be aspiring tomorrow. It could be a year from now or looking down the line and preparing. Can you set the scene for us? So for example, you've got your your major event coming up in DC later this year. Um, What's that like for someone? How does it work? How does it feel? I imagine it could be a bit daunting thinking about someone like a, a Cheryl Betelder, who is just an amazing board member. On a, it would seem like they're on a different pedestal. I could never connect and network with them. Can you break down what it's actually like at NACD? Sure, sure. Well, uh, the big event that you were talking about is our Global Board Leaders Summit, which is in September this year here in Washington. Um, that's a that's a show. Um, <laughs> we have over 250 speakers. Um, we have we're expecting 2,000 people there this year. Uh, it spans a number of days. Um, you can. You you can get anything you need in terms of serving on a board at that venue, um, and and it's kind of become the you know if you're going to go to one event that's what you go to, um, because there's so much of a variety of content that you can immerse yourself in. If you want to talk about strategy, you can go down a path towards strategy. You want to go talk about risk, disruption, innovation, you name it. Mm-hmm. Um, there there will be sessions there. Uh, from a more foundational perspective. Um, for the new and prospective directors, not that they can't go to Summit and, and interact with their peers there. But, you know, we look at if you're if you're new to this game, you really kind of have to have a foundation uh, to, to go into the boardroom with. And you do that through our classes. Mm-hmm. Some of them we call foundation classes, interestingly enough. <laughs> We're not real creative about that. But, well, everybody uh, can understand it. That makes sense. Good marketing. Yeah. So we have our director professional excuse me, director professionalism class, which is geared towards the new and prospective directors or those that might need a refresher on some of the the, the core issues that are fundamental to being in, a, in the boardroom. So you're going to learn your fiduciary duties. You're going to talk about the committees and, and how they're structured and their key focus areas. Uh, you'll talk about strategy. You'll talk about risk. Um, that's kind of the baseline. Uh, then we have an advanced version of that, which is for directors who've been on boards for several years and want to go a little bit deeper into some of the topics. Then we got a, a third level, which is our master's class, which is for the very experienced directors who are really going to be kind of in a, a peer exchange around some of these, these critical issues. They'll go deeper into some case studies and, and, and dive real deep on some issues. Um, and those are our kind of foundation cornerstone classes. But then we have events that are uh, what, what we consider kind of cutting edge. We have a curated program that goes to the Consumer Electronics Show every year hmm. where we, we have Shelley Palmer take groups of people around uh, to the select exhibits that he's selected to tell directors about, you know, these are how disruptive technologies can change your industry. They can change your boardroom. It's things you have to think about that maybe you haven't thought about before. Like we hear uh, about how AI uh, is changing the world. Exactly. And, and, you know, people are always like, well, you know, why is this important to me? And, and to me, it's, it's not the technology, it's the disruption that can potentially come from the technology that you need to be thinking about as a director of where's my next competitor coming from. And it may not be the traditional sources of those groups that we've identified for the last 10 years, it may be somebody that doesn't even, isn't even in your business right now, but might be next year. So we're trying to span the, the perspective a little bit in terms of we can, we can get you the foundation stuff. We can get you the, the, 
even the advanced stuff there, but then you we've got to make you think a little bit differently yeah. about what's it mean to be in that role of a director. And that is things like, you know, the entrepreneurial board forum, the CES experience, future trends, even our podcast, uh, which is future fluency, which is really focused in on diversity and inclusion. And, and what does that mean? Um, and they're all of it. All these things are part of membership in NACD. And that's why we, do what we do is to kind of expand this scope of, you know, this is this is a not an easy thing to do in being a director. It used to be kind of an honorary role that you took on, and, mm-hmm. and now it's a job, and it's pretty serious. You got a lot of scrutiny, and you got folks that are pointing fingers all the time. Just pick up the paper, and you can find the latest company that somebody's pointing a finger at. Activists are active, that's for sure. Right. Well, and I, I will say on a personal note, I'm very excited to be at Summit myself. Can't wait to see that on a level. But there's also, maybe we just talk for a second about on, on the local level, because there are clubs, local might be a strange way to say like New York or Boston, all the major cities will have their own chapters and they will have events. And when I think about networking for the people who are listening to this, right, in some ways you can walk in a room of 2,000 people, not get too small, but a smaller sort of a regional event. I imagine that's a really big part of it as well. Can you help us understand that too? Sure, sure. We have... We have 21 chapters across the country that service about 35, 36 cities. Um, basically, if you think about the National Football League, those are the cities we're in, um, and then some. Um, and they are. They're, they're just as you described it. They're local. Um, they are run by directors in the local community. They run monthly programs. They're either a breakfast, a lunch, or a dinner. Uh, sometimes they're both, depending on which city you happen to, to reside in or, or choose to participate in. And the, the programs are short. You know, there's probably a half hour of networking up front. There's an hour or 45-minute uh, presentation. There might be some networking afterwards. But, again, you're networking with peers in your local community. So uh, if, if you're uh, <laughs> either new to this space or you've been around for a long time, it's an opportunity to hear about something different, uh, hear about it from a director's perspective, uh, in your local community without taking a whole lot of time up. So you don't have to travel, you know, three days and take a few days out of your schedule. You can do it in the morning on your way to work, have a nice breakfast, hear some interesting information from uh, some experts in the field, and be at work maybe half an hour late. It makes it pretty easy <laughs> to, to gain that education. Uh, and I imagine a big part of this, and tell me if this is correct, is when you're in a boardroom under an intense situation, you're not going to ask what the British call the naughty question of, why is this such, or how do we do it this way? Why should it work? Whereas if you're in a room full of peers who are working in different industries, different companies, you can ask more of those questions to learn and grow and educate yourself so you're prepared. Is that fair? Yeah, uh, it's actually a little bit of both, um, if, if you think about it. You know, we always say that directors need to ask the tough questions, and that's where especially in good times. <laughs> you know, it's easy to ask tough questions when things are going south. But right, if right. things are going well and you're not probing, you know, does this make sense? Do do your assumptions still hold water? You know, mm-hmm. are we pressure testing them appropriately? You know, you, you got to ask those tough questions. The nice thing about the network of the 21,000 directors that we have is somebody's been through this before in right. some way shape or form. Right. And by participating in a program, whether it's you know, 45 people, whether it's 30 people or whether it's 100 people, very often those experiences come out because we, we try to tease them out. You know, who, mm-hmm. has, who has seen a different perspective on this than what we may have just heard from the speaker? You know, so you, you get that experiential learning uh, from your peers, and, and that's really the power of that network. And I think that makes great sense. I've always thought of, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can learn from people who have gone before us. And history isn't identical, but it does rhyme a little bit, right? So we can make sure that we've <laughs> picked up from there and take it forward. Now, you were touching on this before, and I'd love to hear the evolution. We talked about just you know, 18 and a half years or so at NACD, even your time there. But if we think back long before, you know, the boards were filled by the CEO's friends. I'm not going to call them cronies, but his buddies down at the golf club or friends he knew from the bar. It's like, hey, you'd be great. Why don't you come join my board? And that's not how directors are picked. They certainly shouldn't be how directors are picked these days. But that's not all that has changed over the past, say, decade or two in terms of the director landscape. Can you help frame that for us, the way that you see the differences between the old days and now? Yeah, and, you know, I hate to even think about the old days, um, but it, <laughs> if, if you think about so it... They're, they're not the good old days, then. is what you're saying. <laughs> right, but it, it 
kind of makes sense. All right, you know, if, if you think about it, all right, I'm a CEO of a company and I need some advice. I'm going to call my friends. They're the mm-hmm. guys that I know and I trust. And and back then it was guys. I mean, <laughs> we, we weren't talking a whole lot about diversity, but right. there was. You, you went to those that you knew and you trusted. It's a little different now. It's a lot different now. Number one uh, is the scrutiny that's put on boards by the institutional investors, by the shareholder community at large, um, saying, well, well, who are these people that have been selected to help oversee this company? And do they have the right skill sets? Do they have the right experience? Do they have the right knowledge? Do they bring a diverse perspective to this dialogue? So are, do they all look exactly the same sitting around that table, or do we have some people that look differently? Um, have different experiences to bring to bear that might bring some new ideas uh, from their perspective, from their experience. So this evolution that's taken place over the last several decades um, has been a very positive one, I think, for companies uh, in terms of they are getting more diverse perspectives. Is it where it needs to be? Not quite, but it's moving in in a strong direction right now. And I think over the course of the next few years, we're going to see a lot more diversity on boards. And again, the you know I would say the company's most valuable real estate is sitting around that boardroom table. Mm. Um, those those seats are incredibly valuable if they're used the right way. Are they a strategic asset for the company? And in order to be a strategic asset for the company, you you have to have the right mix of people that are sitting around that table. Um, so there, it's no longer the CEO's friends. Um, there's an independent group that nominates those people uh, to to join the board or potentially join the board. Um, and independence breeds independence. So, you know, as we've moved towards the, you know, the large majority of companies have uh, one uh, management person on the board that's usually the CEO, and, and pretty much everybody else is independent. You might see another officer on the board here and there, mm-hmm. um, some of the bigger companies, but predominantly it's it's the CEO. So that independence that's there fosters greater independence. And interestingly enough, uh, the greater diversity, it fosters greater diversity, too. So, you know, we're, we're starting to bring in different perspectives. Um, I, I think it's going to be really, really beneficial for companies as they can sin- continue to move down this path. Um, because the competition, as I said earlier, isn't the traditional competition. Disruption's coming at us from every angle. And so the more different perspectives you can get on how do we deal with that, how do we compete in this environment that's new, um, it's new to everybody, uh, the better off our companies are going to be. And that makes absolute sense. And there's such a buzz about diversity as a single word for the boardroom. And uh, we've seen lots of justifiably so movement around getting women onto boards. I think we're seeing a lot more elevation about people of color, uh, women of color onto boards. Uh, I know when I moved over to London, lived overseas for seven years, the diversity of thought in my own mind changed dramatically as I was impacted by the world. So I think different uh, social backgrounds, economic backgrounds, all of that, just like you said, that diversity of thought that comes into the room. What is uh, your take on diversity in the right way forward for boards? We've, we're seeing so much in the news of the way boards are finding adversities by adding more seats because uh, the directors have gotten out or aren't leaving. What are your thoughts on how diversity is going to be changing the boardroom over the next, say, five or so years? I, I, as, I, as I was just alluding to, I, you know, I think the, the diversity of the perspectives is going to be a competitive advantage, and, and that's where we've got to look at it. It's, it's, it really is broadening the spectrum, broadening the lens that we look at our long-term value creation uh, mechanisms through, and whatever those mechanisms may be, whatever the strategic uh, objective is, having a variety of different thoughts, experiences uh, to bring to bear on how we're going to plan this out, how we're going to execute on it, um, to me, is, is we have to look at diversity as a competitive advantage, and that's the only way to, to really focus in on it. And I think it's going to change how we do business in a lot of different ways um, by adding different perspectives, uh, by creating new products and services, and, and, and really being much more mindful of, of competitive issues that again, you know, I, I kind of mentioned this before, but our competitors today are not necessarily the traditional ones we've always thought of. It's the company that's developing something um, to deliver 
uh, value to your customer in a way that you've never even thought of yet. Um, and, and that's where disruption comes in. I think that the opposite of that is also true, is that the diverse perspectives help us with innovation. Mm-hmm. And, and thinking about innovation in a different way. And, you know, are we really servicing the, pro- the, the market in the best way we possibly can? Or do we have different thoughts about that? And, and could we go in a different direction? So um, I think it's going to be a positive all the way around. I like that. It's a good way to frame it. And I think this probably also ties in with some of the stuff we said before about director education. And I would argue that it is more important than ever before, and probably for multiple reasons. You're thinking there is so much more desire from a larger pool of people to be on a board. How do you differentiate yourself? The education, I think, is a, is a start. Clearly, the networking that comes from that as a byproduct is also a great thing. But we're talking about how the boardroom has changed. You need that uh, new perspective, that new information. What are your thoughts around that, about the importance of director education? <laughs> well, considering it's the core to our business. <laughs> <laughs> I figured you'd have a perspective on it, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a high priority. Uh, this is, uh, we just announced that in, in October of this year, we're launching the first certification for directors. And we have been working on this for quite some time now. We, we wanted to announce before we got there because we've got a lot of, uh, pieces we've got to pull together in terms of the coursework that we're already offering. Uh, you know, I walked you through the different levels of, of education that we offer. Certification to us is the next logical step in this. Um, and if we think about the discussion we've been having about new and prospective directors differentiating yourselves or themselves, as you just indicated, uh, a credential is, is something that, that can help do that. And the idea that we are going to not only deliver education in a very fulsome way, looking at what's the job to be done, um, but we're going to test people on on their absorption of that knowledge and the the, the ability to to prove that they understand what it is. And interestingly enough, you know, as I said, we've been working on this for well over a year in terms of pulling all these pieces together uh, to get this ready. In the last year, what we saw was a large influx of new first-time directors going on large company boards, which hasn't really happened in the past. You know, usually you took a traditional route. Um, you know, you went to a maybe you were a nonprofit director in your local community, then you went to a private company board, maybe you went to a small public company board, and then you worked your way through the system uh, mm-hmm. to to get up into the bigger companies. Um, what we're seeing now partly because of this push for uh, new new thinking in the boardroom, is we've seen a lot of first-time directors go on very large company boards. I think it just kind of puts merit behind the idea that, you know, maybe we ought to have a grounding in what the foundational knowledge ought to be about the job before you go take that role. Um, and that's what our certification is designed to do. We actually uh, created it with directors, uh, so you know our mantra for years has been by directors and for directors, um, meaning our education is delivered by sitting directors who have who have been through these issues themselves. They've sat in the seat. Uh, they're probably currently sitting in a different director's seat, right. um, but they can share their their live experience with you. And then we bring in subject matter experts on top of it. Um, what we did with this was have directors come and really think about what's the job? What, what do I do every time I go sit in that boardroom? How do I prepare? What are the critical issues that I'm going to think about? And we get, captured all that knowledge. We combined it with some of our existing uh, education programs, and that's creating the, the baseline foundation for our certification program. They actually helped write the test. Um, we had 30-some-odd directors, I believe, in here a couple weeks ago for three days writing questions <laughs> about what's it take to be in the boardroom and and those are what are going to be in the exam um, that will be alongside the certification so I think you know we're, we're setting up the the differentiator for the new people coming in and I think you know what will happen over time is the sitting directors will go you know I probably ought to have that certification as well whether well, you know I, I've been in the game for a little while but you know, I think it's important to demonstrate that I have that knowledge as well, so that you know we're all we're all reading from the same sheet of music, so to speak. Um, and I think it's going to be a game changer. 
So then it sounds like in some ways you'll have different reasons for people who are approaching it perhaps more than ever before. So we talked at the very beginning about networking might be the driver. Others thinking now of, well, I already have the network and skills. So I've got a portfolio board careers, but I want to make sure that I know what I need to do, especially because it's a more litigious world than ever before with my fiduciary responsibilities. And others thinking, I just, I need to go through the curriculum. The other stuff will be helpful on the sides. Does that seem that the world will be thinking about NACD in different ways? Does that seem right to you? Well, you know, I hope they, they, continue to think those that are involved with us now continue to think of us as a leading resource for mm. them in the boardroom. Um, and I, and I hope that the, the new and prospective directors think about us, uh, differently than they have before. We're, you know, I think people frame their, <clears throat> their, uh, perceptions around names sometimes. And, you know, we are the national association of corporate directors. Sometimes people think of associations as, you know, sleepy little organization. Right. Uh, we're not we're not that <laughs> we're here to help and and we've got resources uh, we've got educational programs we've got research primary research that we do every year to try to help directors be better in the boardroom and that's really what it's all about is elevating board performance so. and for people who are listening in there might be a, a portion I'm not sure what size of it is who, who talk about a professional portfolio role. So you talked about a path where people are, I'm going to liken it to baseball, moving up through the minor leagues, getting to the, the center field for the Yankees and they get that giant public company board role. And there's some people that are thinking beyond just that of eventually, I'd like to leave the C-suite. I would just like to have multiple board roles, Betsy At- Atkins type approach, right? Where I have all of these great companies and that's what I'm doing and I'm very happy with it. Do you recommend a different path for those sorts of people or is it proceeding in the same way? Uh, it, it really depends on from whence you came, so to speak. Mm. Uh, you know, it, if you are a Fortune 500 CFO right now, and you can probably pretty much find a portfolio of companies that you want to sit on, and, and you can do that. Um, not everybody can do that. Not mm. everybody is cut from the same cloth. So it, it really is dependent on your experience levels, um, what you want to do. And, and, I always get worried when people talk about a portfolio of companies because overboarding is a real concern. <laughs> sure. And the institutional investors look at that very, very carefully in terms of how many boards are you sitting on? And do you actually have the time to do that? And some boards take more time than others. That's understandable. Um, but, you know, if something goes bump in the night at a company that you happen to serve on, that time commitment that you signed up for could double or even triple really, really quickly, um, depending on how big the bump is. Um, so you got to be very careful in terms of knowing how much time you're willing to commit to these companies um, and not committing to too many companies because one of them might just might go bump in the night. And then what do you do to all the other companies when you can't come to the meetings? Right. Um, so you really have to balance this out in terms of how much time do I have to spend on all these different companies that I want to be involved in? And, and that's, that's where you're going to see the, you know, the, the large institutional investors start saying, you know, um, Mary is on three public company boards and two private company boards. That's a lot. And, mm-hmm. and can, is, is that really feasible? Should something happen at one of them? Um, some people can do it. Some people can't. And, and it's, it's up to the individual director to take a real hard and honest look at how much time can I commit to doing this. And just for context, for someone who's new to this space, uh, let's talk about a public company board role. You might be talking about maybe 300 hours a year you're spending on it and probably 1,000 plus pages you're reading before the board meetings. So this is a, a sizable commitment before something goes bump in the night, as you said, Peter. Right. And, and those are the averages. And it's funny, you know, we, we measure this every year, and it always fluctuates a couple a couple hours per year. Uh, but that's per board. Mm-hmm. And, you know, depending on who I'm speaking to, if I'm on stage and I say, yeah, it's, you know, I'll use your number, 300 hours per year, uh, some people will laugh <laughs> because they're already spending well in excess of that. Yeah. And, uh, again, it, it's dependent on the company. You, you really got to you got to frame that question correctly um, when you're thinking about joining a board is, you know, what's the average time commitment that is going to be involved here? Because I don't want to overextend myself and I want to give everything I've got to the company I'm talking to Mm -hmm. Um, because it's, it's a job, you know, it's not, 
not to be taken lightly. You, you said in our litigious society, and we also warn directors that, you know, in all likelihood, you're going to get sued in this role. And, you know, the company's going to have to defend you, but you're going to have to go through this process, and it's not fun. Mm-hmm. But that's where that's the society we happen to live in. That's right. So it's uh, it's not all walking on clouds as director. There's a lot of intense responsibilities. That's a very serious role. And I think for some people, understanding that is a big part of, should I actually continue down this path? So for Peter, for some of our audience who are aspiring board members, and they're thinking about, this is something I want to proceed down. And we've talked about all the great stuff at NACD that they can learn from and be educated and network. And in addition to just that, what's the other key piece of advice that you would give to an aspiring board member? Um. Well, I, I can't emphasize the education enough, um, and and really having a good orientation program from the company. Um, and I think, you know, we, we ask a lot of sitting directors who are going through our programs, you know, at the senior level. They've been in the boardroom for quite some time. You know, how often did, or, or did you ever have training in the basics before you went into the boardroom? And mm-hmm. very often they're going to say no. They just brought their management experience to bear and that can be tough because you're in the boardroom you're not asked to manage you're asked to oversee right. and provide advice um and people struggle with that because most people are in in those roles are a type personality they want to get in and they want to dig in with their hands and figure out how to fix the problems and you know we got to deploy this asset and we got to make sure this happens that's hard to do from a director's seat so having a really good orientation about the roles and responsibilities that you're being asked to do and then having a really good orientation from the company about how do they make money what is their business what are their key competitors or or who are their key competitors and and what are the things that they're struggling with in, in the marketplace right now so you have a good grasp of what is this company doing and and how do they execute on their strategy uh, because you're going to be asked to opine on that strategy and, and to help them. Um, and if you don't really know the business, it's really hard to govern. So you got to have both. you got to have the the training around what the job is from a, a broader perspective like we bring to bear, and then a very specific introduction to the company in, in terms of uh, this is this is what i'm I'm going to be charged with. this is this is how they make money and how they're they're going to um, create value in the marketplace. That makes sense. And Peter, I think that's a wonderful way to, to wrap this up today. And I'd like to thank you so much for being part of the Boardroom Bound podcast. And, and as our audience thinks about it, great, I'm so excited. I've got to go take advantage of this. In our show notes to point people uh, to, towards the group and to learn more, should we be linking to the NACD website or is there another resource that you would send us to? I think the website's probably the, the best way to approach us. It has uh, information on all of the stuff we just talked about, our chapter systems, our research is all there. Um, the the information on the certification, there's some up there. There'll be more coming as we get closer to launch date, and all of our education programs are listed as well, and that's uh, natdonline.org. And we will be happy to share more about that certification as it becomes closer, and I know I'm excited to be at the Board Leader Summit, and I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about it then since that's just before the launch. I'm sure that was well-timed to coincide with that lead-up. Yep, it was. There's no mistake there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we were delighted to have you on the show today, Peter. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and helping all of us to be more boardroom bound. Well, thank you. It's great to be with you. That's it for this episode of Boardroom Bound. I really enjoyed chatting with Peter Gleason. It was great to get a peek behind the curtain at NACD and understand how the organization is not only serving board people today, but preparing to better serve them in the future and better prepare them and better educate them and improve their networking opportunities even more. For all of us who are new and aspiring directors, this is the organization that exists to help us. And the reality is for being on a board, it is not easy. And not only getting a board seat is really hard, which is probably what most of the people in the audience are thinking about, but being successful when you're in the boardroom, doing that job well because you're there to do a job and how to be thriving in it. So especially when you think about if you want more than one board seat, you do so well that other opportunities open up for you naturally. So many great opportunities and resources available at NACD. And we will have a link to all of that at podcast.gordon.edu where you can understand the various resources they have and how to get connected. 
Now, if you enjoyed this episode or frankly any other episode of the podcast, I'd really appreciate if you would open up Stitcher or iTunes or Google Play or wherever you're listening to this. And if you'd take just 30 seconds, it won't take any more than that, to leave an honest rating and review, that would be incredibly helpful for us. That's the best way we get out word about this show. I'd also encourage you to stay tuned and subscribe every week because we're working hard to bring you quality content just like we had today. Now, thanks for joining me in this episode of the show. I can't wait to share more stories and strategies from brilliant business minds with you again next week. And remember to keep tuning in to be boardroom bound.